Hi, we're glad to have you. Glad you could make it and join us live for our event tonight. I'm so excited to have you here and we're glad to have you tuning in to today's event to learn all about beavers. My name is Rebecca Ratcliffe. I am the Outreach Associate for the Deschutes Land Trust and will be doing my best to facilitate our event today. As a reminder, our presenter will be the only one with the mic on during this time, so this will help us hear her clearly and also help the rest of us focus in on listening. So thanks for keeping those mics off. We'll be sharing additional information and resources in a follow-up email, so don't fret if you miss an interesting tidbit. Then listen along as we go and be sure to ask your questions in the chat because we'll have time to answer questions toward the end of our hour today. So do send those questions in the chat box. For those of you who are not yet familiar with the Deschutes Land Trust, we are a conservation organization local to Bend, Oregon. We currently protect and care for over 17,000 acres of critical wildlife habitat, incredible streams, and some really stunning natural beauty. With our usual calendar of naturalist guided walks and hikes on hold, we are offering virtual events to bring nature, the nature of Central Oregon home to you. If you are enjoying our virtual content like today's talk, please do consider making a small donation to the Land Trust. Your little support or big support conserves and protects the nature of Central Oregon and I'll be sure to link the donation link into the chat. Then I'm gonna let in a few other folks and I will get us started. Without any further ado, I'd like to introduce you to today's presenter, our very own Jen Seleski. Jen is the Deschutes Land Trust Stewardship Manager. Prior to joining the Land Trust as a staff member, Jen led mountain bike and birding tours for our walks and hike program. Jen enjoys skiing, canoeing, surf trips at the coast, fussing over her landscaping and trying to get things to grow in her garden, and of course, Beavers. So welcome, Jen, and I'll, I'll let you take it away. Thanks, Rebecca, and welcome, everyone. It's so nice to see all your smiling faces. Oh, who am I kidding? I actually can't see any of you. Um, but I am just going to trust that you are there, and I'm going to conjure up all your some familiar faces and some new faces. I know it is a beautiful day out there, so thanks to everybody who is tuning in. I would assume you're probably looking at both my presentation and maybe my face in this really uninspiring office. So if I were you, I would concentrate on the presentation. Um, and I would also go outside with my device and, uh, and listen out there if I were you, because it is a lovely day. So today we're gonna to talk about beavers. And I am gonna start out by talking a little bit about the animal itself, uh, the species, and then we are going to segue into what beavers do and how they do it. And then we're gonna talk about some restoration we're doing here on land trust preserved lands and how that is inspired by beavers. So without no further ado, here we are. Okay, so one of the fun things about doing presentations like this is you get to waste a whole bunch of time on the internet looking for photos for your presentation. And that means that I end up finding things like this. And uh, here we have uh, a couple of different beaver species and somebody there in the middle. Um, this guy in the middle is Justin Bieber. And for a minute there, I couldn't figure out what he was doing there. And then uh, it dawned on me, of course, his last name. It sounds like Bieber. Uh, and apparently, Justin Bieber, Bieber is an average sized human being. And this chart uh, is a comparison of the size of an average human being to, over here, our modern day Bieber, the American Bieber, and this over here, the giant Bieber. Well, I've never heard of the giant Bieber. Uh, so I had to look it up. The giant beaver no longer exists. This was a, not exactly a close relation to our modern beaver. Um, they actually weren't that closely related, but uh, it was 
a beaver type animal that lived about 10,000 years ago uh, during the last North American Ice Age. And this beaver weighed about the size of a black bear, about 130 to 220 pounds, and it was eight feet long. It is unknown whether it actually had a tail that looked like a modern beaver uh, or whether it had webbed feet like a modern beaver. Uh, because those features are not preserved in the fossil records. So we don't really know what this beaver did. Did it build dams? We don't know. Um, but it, it brought up some imagery of this, this massive rodent that built just humongous dams with, I don't know, some really large trees back then. But alas, that beaver is now extinct and we have our modern day beaver. Now the modern day beaver is still the largest living rodent in North America. Uh, it is not the largest rodent in the world, however, that would be the capybara, and the capybara lives in Central and South America. Uh, our beaver weighs about 40 pounds these days, and it is about three feet long, including the tail. The beaver is semi-aquatic, and they have some very specialized features. As I mentioned earlier, they have that long flat tail, and they have actual membranes that can close off their eyes and their nose underwater. Uh, so they're very efficient swimmers. Beavers have very small eyes and they actually don't see very well because uh, they don't really need to. They use other senses that are more important to them. And actually they have excellent hearing and sense of smell. And one of the reasons they have excellent hearing is because beavers need to be able to hear leaks in their dam. Uh, in order to repair it, which is very important for their survival. Uh, beavers, as you probably know, have very sharp incisors, those front teeth, and they are used to cut down trees and to eat, and those teeth are harder on the outside than on the inside, and as they chew, it wears them away on the inside and creates kind of like a shovel shape that digs into trees really easily. Uh, beavers are very territorial and they mark their territory by creating small mounds of mud and leaves and sticks and then they cover that with this pungent oil that they have called castorium and that's how they got their Latin name, Castor canadensis. Uh, their tail is used for many purposes. It is used as a rudder for when they are swimming. Uh, they, when they're on land, they sit upright and they use that tail as a prop. Uh, they actually store fat in it for the winter time. And they also, you probably know well, use it to communicate. Uh, if you've ever been in the water and been spooked by a beaver, you know that they are very adept at using that tail to tell you to go away or to warn other uh, beavers in their family group that danger is near. Beavers are found pretty much anywhere where you can find their favorite foods, and a lot of those uh, you would recognize from rivers and streams around here, alder, willow, cottonwood, um, and you'll find them both along streams and running waters, and we'll find them in lakes, and you'll even find them in man-made waterways, like roadside, ditch, uh, roadside ditches, uh, as long as their food is growing next to those ditches. Uh, they were once the most widely distributed mammals in North America. Um, unfortunately, their pelt um, was very much sought after in the 1800s, and they were pretty much almost trapped to extinction during that time. Uh, eventually, the demand for their pelts declined, uh, and no, seeing that the beaver was going to go extinct if something wasn't done, there were management, wildlife management procedures put in place that slowed the decline of the beaver. And they became reestablished in most, most of the places where they were historically. Uh, these days in Oregon, uh, you can still hunt trap beavers. Um, unfortunately, they are seen as a nuisance animal because they, they dam and they flood places. Um, so as a private landowner, you can remove them without, well, you can kill them without a permit. Uh, you can also remove a lodge without a permit. I believe that removing a dam requires a permit, but 
even if you try, let me tell you, uh, beavers are not to be deterred. If you just remove their dam, they will be right back there and they might rebuild that whole thing again in a night. They are good builders. Uh, and nowadays you do have to have a, uh, a license and a fee if you want to remove beavers. Ah, beaver ID. So when I was in grad school, I actually studied river otters. And I would tell people that I would study river otters and then they'd see me again later and they're like, oh, you're the beaver lady. Um, because these species actually do look quite alike, especially when you see them in the water, they're often confused. Um, so I have up here some photos of some animals that are furry and brown that you might see swimming in the water and um, I can't talk to you, but maybe you can take a look and tell me if you know which one of these is a beaver. And if you can't find the beaver, it's because there isn't one here. Uh, but these are all even close up. So you can imagine that from far away, a beaver swimming in the water can look like a lot of other animals. On the upper left hand side there, we have the sea otter. On the upper right hand side, I believe that is a nutria, which is a non-native species. Uh, we've got a bear in there. On the lower left hand side, we have a river otter. And on the lower right, I, that's the muskrat. Um, so they actually can be quite hard to tell apart until they get out of the water or you get a really good look at them. Uh, other ways to ID them is well, obviously their, their habitat, um, sometimes tracks. Uh, otter tracks are relatively unique. Um, Okay, beaver families. So a mated pair of beavers will typically live together for many years and sometimes they stay together for life. They typically breed in the early months, uh, January through March, and their litters are usually about four kits. And the number of kits that they have is typically tied to the amount of food uh, that they can get. The kits will live with the adults for about one to three years and beavers live in familial groups that contain the, the mother and the kits of the year and sometimes a few kits from past years. And populations are typically limited by habitat availability and you typically will not see more than one family group every say half a mile. Uh, adult beavers don't have a whole lot of enemies. When they are in the water, they're relatively safe. And on land, uh, they could be predated upon by bears or coyote or wolf or domestic dogs. I would assume that probably humans are their most, most lethal enemy. Uh, they stick to the water, but beavers can travel quite a ways, maybe 150 feet from the water to find food if they need to. Um, some other things that can kill beavers are severe winters, um, disease, fluctuations in the water, and even, I have wondered about this, falling trees. I'm assuming they're talking about the ones that they fell themselves. And, you know, I, I don't know, I've never actually seen a beaver live cutting down a tree. I've, of course, seen evidence many, many a time. Uh, but apparently it does happen that they can take themselves out or perhaps um, one of their family members when they bring down one of those very large trees. So kind of dangerous. Um, and beavers typically will live for about five to ten years in the wild. Beavers foraging levels are probably the greatest in the fall when they're getting ready for winter. And beavers, it's, a lot of times people think that beavers actually live in their dams, but this is typically not true. Beavers will live either in a separate lodge that they build out of the same things that they build their dams out of, uh, sticks and mud and rock. Uh, they will build a mound and then they will create chambers within that mound where they either sleep or they eat. They have a latrine in there, uh, they give birth in there, and typically that will have an entrance that goes under the water because it's less likely that a predator will be able to get to them. Um, 
if they don't build a lot, sometimes they'll actually just if, dig into a bank. If it's easy to dig uh, mud, instead of building a lodge, they'll make a, a bank den and then also have those chambers in there. And then sometimes they build a lodge over that. Um, and it's important for beavers to stash food during the end of summer and into fall so that in winter they have something to eat. Which brings us to what they are most famous for, their, their dams. And beavers build dams for a number of reasons. Um, but generally it's to impound and pool water. And once they build that water up deep enough, they can store food down below at the bottom so it doesn't freeze and then all winter long they actually go down into the bottom of that pool of water to eat in case the, their food source um, up top is either depleted or frozen or covered with snow. Uh, so beaver dams important for feeding, uh, important for protection from predators. So most of the predators they can swim away from and swim under the water from. And they are, they provide a safe place for their, those entrances to, to their um, bank dens and lodges that I was talking about earlier. And also when they impound water, uh, that means that that wetted edge is growing more of their favorite um, species that they like to eat, that cottonwood and that alder and willow. So beaver dams, they do build dams for themselves. But the nice thing is that a lot of other species benefit from this too, including humans. Um, some human benefits of beaver dams are that these dams slow river water and help diversify the flow. So if you don't have these obstacles like beaver dams, the water is going to flow fast, right? When the water slows, it builds up, gets deeper, um, and this reduces the velocity of the water. So you have less down cutting of the stream and more water spreading out. When you have more water spreading out, you're going to wet the soil to the sides and that's where we get meadows and all that nice stream side habitat. Uh, it reduces what we call flashiness. So oftentimes in some streams when it rains you have a lot of water flowing really fast and then it stops raining and then you have then the you have very little water in the stream but if you've got these beaver dams you've got pooling and it keeps water in the stream at all times um, when you have pooling the water slows down and sediments and nutrients filter out of the water to the bottom and that improves water quality for fish uh, it increases underground water storage, so this pooling of water means that water is leaking back into, say, an underground aquifer and recharging that, which humans use those. That's what we, when we put in wells, we're, we're putting wells into aquifers. Uh, increases streamside vegetation, as I said before, and not only is that good for us, um, good for agriculture too, but it's also good for birds and everybody else who lives in the vegetation besides streams and lakes. Uh, and also it reduces summer water temperatures. Deeper water stays cooler and a lot of our local fish species like trout like cooler water. So not only can beavers build beaver dams, but as it turns out, people can too. Um, people have been building like beavers for quite a long time, uh, but I would say that this has been popularized, popularized recently. Uh, restoration is really important right now. Um, those of us who are familiar with the work that we do here at the Deschutes Land Trust might know of some projects that we've done on Wychus Creek out at Camp Polk and Camp Polk Preserve and our Wychus Canyon Preserve. Uh, we've undertaken some big stream restoration projects out there. Uh, and they've been very successful and we are monitoring them and we're seeing gains in, in habitat both in the stream and beside the stream uh, that we're hoping for. But those projects can be expensive and there's a lot of disturbance that goes along with them. You have to bring in heavy machinery. Um, and then afterwards, because there was so much disturbance, we have to do a lot of replanting. So 
this is kind of a, an alternative to some of the projects that we have been doing lately. And instead of going in and moving a bunch of earth around, um, we go in and we build structures like a weaver does. So our Willow Springs Preserve is actually a good candidate for this type of restoration. Uh, this is Willow Springs here, and this is White Juice Creek running down the middle of it. And White Juice Creek, like much of the streams in this area, was straightened back in the 1960s, and it was pushed up along here to alleviate flooding. And as you can see, it's, it's no longer there. The creek has jumped its berms and it is re-meandering itself across the meadow. And you can see these green areas. Uh, these are areas that have improved over the last several decades. So the creek here is actually kind of restoring itself, which is great. And if we waited many, many decades, maybe centuries, um, we might have some really good fish habitat in here. Uh, but unfortunately, a lot of our fish, fish species need spawning and rearing habitat now. So we're trying to speed up this restorative process. And instead of going in here and doing what we did at Camp Polk in White Chess Canyon, where we cut down the floodplain um, and made a really big disturbance and then let the, the creek re-meander itself through there, we're not gonna do that. We're gonna kind of leave things, but we're going to put in a bunch of beaver dam-like structures. So we are in the process of planning that restoration. Um, but in the meantime, we did a little pilot project out at Camp Polk. And Camp Polk is where we've done some previous restoration, but there's still some areas that we think we can kind of nudge a little bit to get more of what we want. And so we planned a little project uh, with a local uh, consultant, Anna Branch Solutions, that primarily does this build like a beaver type restoration. And if this took about maybe, I think we're out there for two to three days. Um, I just threw this photo in here because it's beautiful. We had a, a lovely morning with this amazing rainbow. And you know when you see that in the morning that you're, you're gonna have a successful project and a great day. Um, but I digress. So two types of structures that are often used in building like a beaver. Um, this type of restoration has kind of a language all of its own. And the first type of structure I'm gonna tell you about is called a PAL, P-A-L-S. That stands for a post-assisted log structure, um, which is really just a, a fancy name kind of for a bunch of logs in the river. Um, so these structures are like big log jams that you see happen naturally in many river systems. And we bring in a bunch of trees and we anchor them to the side of the creek. They do not cut all the way across the channel. Um, the water still has to be able to get by them. And this is something that you do in kind of a, a main channel of a stream. And the job of these structures is to push the water into the side of the river bank to cut away at it and create more meandering of the stream. So you do this in a place where typically the stream might be too straight and you want it to push the water around more. Uh, building these is quite a bit of work as you can see here. We started out with some heavy machinery. We got some juniper trees that were being removed from a housing project and those all had to be carted over to our restoration project and stored there. And then luckily we were able to drive pretty close to the creek and so we could put all those trees on a trailer drive them over to the creek, and then use manpower to drag them off of the trailer. And then we would bring them by hand over to the river. And here are the posts that we're going to use to anchor them into the side of the river. So all those had to be brought out. As you can see, they kind of look like big pencils. Um, we buy these posts and then they actually create the, the pointed ends with a chainsaw. And here's some of our folks putting the trees, moving them into place. 
And this is kind of where it's both an, an art and a science, really, where you put these trees. And then we used this hydraulic post pounder. So we had to haul that out there too. And this is powered by gas generator. So all that had to come out there and they anchor these trees into place by pounding these posts in kind of across the stream. And here's an overview. And so you can see the this is kind of a panoramic here and the, the water is coming this way. It's going to hit this log jam. It's going to be pushed over here and then it's going to be pushed over here. And then hopefully as they work on the rest of this, then it's going to be pushed this way. And here's a couple more post assisted log structures here. And see, this is going to cause the water to kind of wind through this one. Here's a good view of this one pushing water over this way. So these structures really only do their work at high flow events. So you're not going to see much happening over the summer. And then typically in the fall and winter, and then in the spring with snow melt, we're going to have these peak flows where we get a lot of water and that's when all the work is going to be done with using this type of structure. Another pal. So as you can see, this is a you know there's it's inspired by beavers, but this type of structure is a is a little bit different because um, beavers, of course, will build all the way across a stream, whereas these only go part of the way across. However, if you build what is called a beaver dam analog or a BDA. Uh, you're getting closer to the type of structure that you actually see a beaver build. Um, BDAs are super fun to build. Uh, they're much easier than a PAL, uh, post assisted log structure. These you can build all with material on site except for potentially some posts if you want to use them, you don't have to. And like a beaver, these span the entire channel. We typically build these off of smaller side channels. And these ones, whereas with the PALs, you only see them do the work at certain times of year, these are super fun because literally as you're building them, you are impounding water behind that dam um, right then. So kind of a, a, an immediate gratification. And these can be built easily with volunteers. And as you can see here, uh, we're just clipping alder and willow that's already there. There's plenty to supply, especially at Camp Polk with all, the, with all the willow and alder that's grown up since our original restoration project back in 2012. And as well as uh, trees, a lot of mud and rocks get used, which actually beavers use as well. We don't typically think of beavers moving rocks, but they do. And here's some volunteers. You can see there's quite a bit of water behind here versus here. And there's looking at the back side of one of the beaver dam analogs. So these structures aren't really meant to be permanent, especially the beaver dam analogs, um, depending on the flows that you get, uh, they will evolve over time. Some of them will wash out, some of them will wash into others. We typically build quite a few in an area. Um, some of them will build up. But the cool thing is, is they will oftentimes recruit beavers. And I think we built maybe seven or eight of these on this pilot project. And I went back within a week or two and you could go out there and, and look at where you had built them. And if you look close enough, you could determine the difference between the sticks that we cut with our loppers and ones that were cut with beaver teeth. And you could actually see where the beavers locally had found this structure and were actually adding to it. And this is really cool. It's it's hard to tell what's going on in this photo, but if you look here, this is actually one of the BDAs that we built and the water is flowing. Whoops, hold on. I clicked. 
the water is flowing in this direction down this little side channel. And what we have over here is moments before, this was a dry side channel that was cut in our original restoration project, but water never flowed down it. So when we built this BDA, water backed up here and went down the side channel and it followed it all the way. I think my next photo, or yeah, shows it. Yeah, so that's this channel here. And this whole thing was dry and then it was wet and I believe it still is. And then it reconnects, there's actually a pond down here and it reconnects into there. Uh, so that was really cool. And I believe that last, last year, my coworker Peter went out there and he did a willow planting all along here because now that this is wet, so is all the soil along here. And so hopefully we'll be able to recruit some, some willow and some alder in there as well. And we're really hoping, you know, unfortunately this whole COVID thing has thrown a wrench into everything, but actually I, I created this map in order to have volunteers go out and be able to monitor these beaver dam analytes, be able to tell us what's changing over time and uh, if they've blown out or if they're building up and how much other beaver activity is out there. Um, but we haven't really been able to do that, hope to in the future. Um, but I, I definitely have seen that there is, um, they are changing over time and the beavers that typically are down here um, have moved up here and are, are definitely interested in what we're doing. So it's mutual. And speaking of, so these are the Camp Polk beavers and they're actual real dams built by real beavers. That little pond I was just talking about where our newly wetted channel was flowing in, this is a beaver dam that was built down in there uh, last year. This is probably three feet high. Um, and this is the same uh, dam from the side. So pretty impressive. They are hard at work out there. And then this one here is in that same area. This is a Ponderosa uh, that fell down and the beavers are building up under here. And last I heard this, this whole thing is covered under there. They'll take advantage of a structure like this, which is pretty cool. And other areas, uh, this is Copper Ranch, a Deschutes Land Truck Trust Conserve property. And this is Mill Creek that runs through it. And I noticed this beaver dam out there last year. I hadn't really seen much beaver activity out there before. So that's kind of exciting. And this is a, a working ranch. There's agriculture there. Um, they have some cattle as well. And there's, tenants there that farm and they're actually really excited to have the beavers there. Um, like I said, a lot of people find them to be a nuisance because they flood things, but they think that they are being, they're beneficial to irrigation there because of this water impoundment. So it's a fine balance. Well, I guess that brings us to the end and I'm sure y'all have some questions. I hope I will be able to answer some of them. As I mentioned before, uh, I'm, I'm not a beaver expert. I am, I am learning as well, but they're a pretty amazing creature and it sure seems like we have a lot to learn from them. So if you do have questions, I can try to answer. Thanks so much, Jen. Lots of beaver knowledge, lots of beaver information to soak in. Um, while I give folks online and watching live a chance to ask their questions either in the chat or the comments box, I wanted to just encourage folks to consider making a donation today supporting the land trust. Um, your support will help us protect these amazing places and incredible critters like beavers um, and also continue to do the restoration stream restoration work that Jen has mentioned. So uh, you can donate online or by using the Facebook button. Um, and thanks so much for all that support. It looks like I've got some questions coming through. So I will continue to sort these out and we'll try to get to as many as we can. Thanks so much, Karen, for your donation. Our first question, we'll start this one off, Jen, I think you can answer this one. Yeah. Have you brought any beavers in? So mm. brought in beavers. Mm. Brought in beavers. Well, um, 
So not, uh, not intentionally, none have been translocated to any of our preserves. I'm, I'm guessing that might be what the question is, if, if they've actually been moved to one of our locations. Uh, that has not happened. Um, yeah, moving beavers, moving any wild animal is, um, there's pros and cons. Um, you know, with beavers, we, you know, potentially that is something we could accommodate at some point somewhere. Um, but we always have to think about things like, okay, well, what other animal is living there now? So we might be able to bring a beaver in, but if there's already a beaver there, then that might create a territorial problem. Um, so basically it's, there's lots of pros and cons and it, it was, you know, it's something we could consider, uh, but has that happened yet? Um, so yeah, we have not intentionally brought them in. I would say that we have, we have encouraged them to come and they have come to a lot of, we've seen an uptick in beaver activity um, at a lot of our conserved lands. So we, we've brought them in that way. Hope that answers your question. Thanks, Jen. I think that was a great answer. Beavers are a tricky beast for sure. There's a lot of balance going on. And I think this next question, um, adds into that a little bit. So maybe just a quick response to this next one is, do people want to have beavers? Does it generally feel like people want them or they want to get rid of them? Um, I think you and I could both agree that there's probably always people on all sides, but what's the general? <sighs> yeah, no, that's a great question. And yeah, I think you kind of answered it, Rebecca. There is a, there's a range of attitudes toward beavers depending on what your objectives are. Um, so, you know, me from my standpoint of what I do, I feel a lot of uh, positive attitudes toward beavers out there. Um, however, I know that, I mean, realistically, they, they can be a problem if you're a farmer and beavers are constantly flooding your fields or blocking up culverts or perhaps even flooding your house. Um, but that can be frustrating and there's a there's a lot of things that can be done so that people and beavers can live together uh, somewhat harmoniously. Um, Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife definitely has a lot of information on their website. They have a lot of good just beaver information as well, by the way. Um, so if you have other questions um, about their, their biology and life history, etc., or about living together with beavers, they, they offer a lot of good information, as well as uh, BeaverWorks, which is kind of a, a newish organization here in Central Oregon. They, I, mean, I know that those folks have a lot of information on how to, to deal with problem beavers. Um, but yeah, so range of attitudes for sure. Super. Yeah, lots of good information out there. And I would imagine that some of those resources that Jen just mentioned could answer these next three questions, but I'm gonna pose them to Jen just in case you feel like you wanna answer them. Number one, how long would it take a beaver to eat through a tree? <laughs> Number two, how big are beaver teeth? Number three, how far can a beaver swim? Oh gosh. <laughs> Uh, let's see, we're gonna take this one at a time. Uh, number one was... How fast, or how long would it take a beaver to eat through, eat a, tree? through a tree? Right, thank you. Gosh, these are actually great questions um, that I don't know the answer to. First of all, it depends on the size of the tree and the species and the hardness. Um, and probably the motivation of the beaver. And, um, but I, it's, it's a good question because I think what I'm, I see a lot of, and y'all probably do too, is that they're, they're coming and going from, especially some of these large trees, because you see them half cut down all the time, right? So a beaver might work at a tree for a while, or, you know, go take a rest, come back and work some more. And I don't know what their strategy is there. Is this something that they are going to work on every single day until they cut it down? Or are they going to work on it, forget on it, forget about it, go somewhere else, come back? Um, so yeah, the question just begs more questions. And I'm sorry, I don't have a better answer. Beginning a true scientific inquiry here. Right. A question that brings more questions. Yeah. I'll leave the other two up to the imagination of our audience. <laughs> we can research how big beaver teeth are 
and uh, how far they can swim on your own and let us know what the answer is. Okay, yes. Our next question is from Pamela, thank you. How are you monitoring the number of beavers in your watersheds? Do you have trail cams? Mm. Yeah, we do have some trail cams. I would say that we are we are not monitoring them in a way where we're tracking how many beavers are in a certain area. Uh, an easier question to answer is how many beaver groups we have and we can kind of tell that by how many uh, how many dams we have on the property. Although beavers, a, a group of beavers will build more than one dam. So typically you'll have an area and you'll see quite a bit of beaver activity. Um, and then, yeah, then you'll see a little bit less between territories, I would say. I think that number of half a mile between uh, beaver colonies is pretty useful. So I would say like take Camp Polk. I, I would bet that there is one group of beavers there. It's got some pretty good habitat, you know, it's coming back. Um, so that would be, that would be my guess. I don't know how many beavers that actually is, but probably only one group. Um, Willow Springs, I don't know. I see, I see evidence of beavers gnawing there, but I'm not seeing much damming activity. So my guess is that those might be beavers from Camp Polk or from the other direction. Um, yeah, sorry. Don't know if that really answers your question either, but I would say that we've got, we've got some decent beaver activity out there going on. And definitely, like you mentioned before, as this activity, the restoration activity and the beaver activity continue. Yeah. I'm hoping to get some folks involved with monitoring that activity yeah. in yep. a bit more scientific or closer kind of a manner. So mm -hmm. stay yeah. tuned. We'll have yeah. more info. Uh, the next question is a similar one, but at a larger scale. Sure. It's is the beaver population in Central Oregon a healthy size? Hmm. Honey. Yeah, I would say that we could use, generally speaking, more beaver. Um, but that means we have to create more habitat for them because obviously if they don't have if they don't have food and they can't pool water, then you can't have beavers. And I know a lot of our streams could benefit from beaver activity. Um, and some, you know, it's kind of this chicken and the egg. Sometimes you can bring beavers into an area that had that where they were ex um, extirpated from, and there will be enough for them to stay. Um, other times, you have to bring, you have to improve the habitat, and then the beavers will follow. So, yeah, I would say we could definitely use more beavers doing restoration work for us on our streams. I like the sound of more beavers. They're so furry. <laughs> this next question is from Bunny and Mark, and I actually was able to look this one up so Jen could take yeah. a quick breather. The question is typically, how long do beavers live? Google says from 10 to 15 years, oh. though there have been some beavers known to break the 20 year wow. mark when they were living in captivity. Yes. So they get to be a bit old, kind of like my cat. Yes. The next question, Jen, is from Lynn. And I think this would be a great one to talk a bit about. What is the objective at Willow Springs? And, and similarly, yeah. um, Camp Polk. And how will you know if it's successful? OK, yeah. Uh, so I would say that we want to see we're looking for improved processes there. So we want to see more, uh, more channel length. Um, so instead of that, well, what used to be a straight channel that is already meandering, we want to see more meandering. We would like to see hopefully additional channels. So that channel splitting off into 
more channels, which means more habitat for fish and wildlife. Uh, we would like to see the stream use more of that, uh, I guess what you would call an, an old floodplain where the, the stream used to cut through. Um, and we would like to see the stream more closely connected to the floodplain. So I talked a little bit about channel incision earlier, where when you straighten the stream, the water gets really fast and then it cuts down. And when that water cuts down, it pulls water from the meadows and the stream side areas down with it and that dries out those meadows. So once where there was maybe uh, lots of wetland and um, those, the, the beaver's favorite foods, alder and cottonwood and aspen, um, when that water draws down from that stream incision, those plants die off and they're typically replaced around here um, with invasive weeds. And so we have this dysfunctioning ecosystem there. So hopefully if the beavers, if we build these beaver dam analogs and PAL structures in there, we're gonna push the water around, it's gonna slow down, it will, uh, it will fill in and that stream will come back up and that water will flow back out into those meadows again. And then we can either help by replanting some of those wetland species or a lot of them hopefully will recruit on their own. Does that kind of answer the question? Yeah, I think you want to see more water everywhere. More water everywhere, <laughs> more wetland everywhere, more fish. Lynn says yes everywhere. and thank you. Good. So I will uh, swing us over to our next question, um, which is kind of about that end goal, right? If, if you do have beaver dams yeah. in a stream, can salmon still swim up the stream? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Yes, they can. Uh, beaver and salmon basically evolved together. So although it seems like you are blocking, you might be blocking movement of fish, there is enough, uh, there, will, there will be enough holes in those dams that the beavers build, and hopefully in ours too. We're not the best at building beaver dams. Beavers are the best at building beaver dams. But eventually, yes, the salmon will be able to get through, believe it or not. They evolved to do it. I'm looking here and I have two more. Okay. So we'll see if you can give them your best shot. The first one, will there be a point when there are too many beavers on our preserves? Mm -hmm. I would say no, um, because they will self-limit. There will not be enough food, so they will have less kits and they will disperse further. I do notice sometimes with restoration and beavers that they will kind of, like as you're at the beginning of a restoration project process, really, the beavers will kind of hammer that new vegetation. Um, and so that, that can, that can be a fine kind of balance point is keeping enough to recruit more vegetation um, while allowing the beavers to utilize it. Because um, you don't want to be absolutely everything and have nothing left. And that's, that's it's kind of a, a risk. And, you know, one of those things that does happen is they can, they can really, they can really eat a lot um, in one area. And if it's just starting to come back, that can kind of slow that process a little bit. And sometimes you just kind of got to cross your fingers and hope it all works out. Thanks, Jen. Yep, yeah. I think an interesting fact, you know, about the beavers that you shared earlier is that there were so many beavers in the West and in, and in the United States. And I think, um, it's interesting to think about how many beavers could there have been? Right. A lot. A lot. Yes. Well, I have one more question before I ask you what your favorite thing about beavers is. So mm -hmm. be thinking about that. Okay. But before we get to that last question, here's one to think on. Who would win in a race to build a dam? 
Humans or beavers? Oh, hands down the beavers. <laughs> hands down. They don't, they do not get permits. Uh, they don't ask anybody where they can build. And yeah, they are, they are very industrious. As we know, I know it's a cliche, but it is true. Busy beavers. Um, yeah, they're amazing. I have read accounts back in the day of people dynamiting these massive dams and seriously they wake up the next morning and it's rebuilt so beavers are very good at what they do i i yeah i'm i vote for the beavers thanks and bunny i see your question we're not quite going to get to it i do want to uh, have time for this last question then uh jen are there any other things you would like to to share or to say, encourage people on, and then could you share what your favorite thing about beavers is? Uh, gosh, favorite thing about beavers. Um, man, I don't know. I guess I would just encourage people to, to get out there and next time you're out by a river or a stream, you know, pay attention and look for those signs of beavers. Uh, they're a really cool animal and I find it really fun to go out and look for what they have been doing. I think it's always fun to find beaver sign and then next thing you know, you're like, wow, huge dam and there's the lodge. The lodges can be hard to find uh, as well as the bank dens and for good reason, because of course they want to remain safe. Uh, my favorite thing about beavers, um, uh, gosh, I don't know. I just, I, I just, uh, I'm inspired by them, I suppose, and what they have taught us, which, you know, we shouldn't have had to, to be taught, really. Um, we're doing this work, building things like a beaver because of, you know, these unfortunate past management decisions that we've made that were not good for our rivers and streams. Um, but I like the fact that instead of just thinking about what we as humans can do with our, our tools and our machinery and our brains that uh, we had to break that back down to what nature already knows how to do and we had to learn to emulate that, which is really cool. Um, I also like their tails and how they scare the heck out of me uh, when I'm on the river sometimes. <laughs> that slap, that's pretty cool. They are absolutely so cool and I would second uh, for folks to keep an eye out while you're on your way. Uh, thanks Jen so much for sharing all your handy information about beavers and also all the details and updates on the projects out at Camp Polk and Willow Springs Preserves. Yeah. We have plenty more information on those projects on our website, so folks who are asking questions about those projects can check it out there and stay tuned for further updates in the future. Thanks again for joining us today, and I hope you'll be able to tune in again to learn more about the nature of Central Oregon from the comfort of your home. We do have a salmon all about salmon event coming up in October so hopefully you can join us for that. You can subscribe to our newsletter, check out upcoming uh, virtual events, get involved as a volunteer or make a donation at DeschutesLandTrust.org. Thanks Jen, thanks Beavers and Thank hope to see you all again soon. Thanks.